Welcome back to the Fordham Sports Analytics Roundup. I am your host, President Chris Orlando. I'm joined here today with VP Paul Gomes and a special guest, a returning guest speaker, uh, Eric Ebert. He is the um, VP of at Sumer Sports. Um, previously works as PFF as the VP of Research and Development. Uh, Eric, if you want to kind of go more into your career path and how you got into the space. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a it's a career path that I, I'm actually proud to um, to say that doesn't necessarily have to be the way anymore. So, you know, I was um, you know, growing up really loved uh, football. Uh, you know, that's all I really like thought about, in fact. And like I um, I we, you know, went to college uh, division two school in Minnesota, Minnesota State Moorhead, uh, where um, I, I played at the same school that uh, former Bears head coach and I, I'm Montreal Alouettes coach uh, um, Mark Tressman played at. Um, so there, you know, it was it was pretty fun. I I just went to that school because I got a football scholarship. So that was kind of where my mind was at. I majored in math just because I thought it was easy um, and uh, I could do it while also playing sports and doing all the fun college stuff. And then I got kind of you know, into my junior year and realized that I really enjoyed the math. I really enjoyed proving the theorems and all that kind of stuff. And, and, you know, football, I, I was a starter for two seasons. The first year I was a starter, it was kind of one of those where, you know, you realize that, you know, you've been dreaming of this for a, a lot, a long time, and it's not necessarily all that it's cracked up to be. And so I kind of just, you know, shifted a lot of my passion to math. Um, when I finished, I went and got a PhD um, in mathematical biology and applied math at, at University of Nebraska Lincoln. Um, I got sort of a traditional. I was a sort, of, sort of a traditional academic at that point. I got a professor job at a at a school near my wife's hometown in, in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and I was a professor there for six years. Got tenure, all that good stuff. And about halfway when I was there, I. Um, I, I saw an ad for Pro Football Focus, and I was like, "Oh, this is." I've always I always kind of admired them, and um, I always figured that they were doing all this math that like baseball and basketball and all them were doing. And you know, the the more I got into the data, I realized the data was quite rich, but the the work that they were doing was not necessarily all that uh, sophisticated. So then I started putting models together for them, and um, in the right around the draft in 2018, I, I presented a decent amount of our work. Um, to uh, the people at NBC and the people at NBC decided that they needed to pressure uh, Chris Collinsworth and, and, and Neil Hornsby, the two bosses at PFF to hire my, to hire me and, and my, my colleague at the time, George Shahuri. Um, from there, like, you know, George and I took turns kind of um, running sports, you know, running analytics at PFF. Um, by the time I was done there, I had, you know, VP, I had VP title there. Um, but about this time last year, I, I decided I needed a, a change. And so I, I moved over to Sumer Sports and, and started running um, research and development as well as consumer strategy. Uh, and, and so it's been a lot of fun. It's been a, a really fun journey. I don't think anybody else has to take that journey again, which is, I think, a testament to, you know, like, for example, you know, societies like yours and, and, and things that were that are building across the country. I think that the path to sports analytics is still very competitive, but at least now it's more direct and, and people know what to expect. And, and I'm for that. I'm really proud. Yeah, that's a that's a cool path there. Thanks for thanks for sharing. Um, so just to transition here, um, obviously, the, the running back market is a is a very pressing topic uh, in football right now, especially. Uh, with all these holdouts, JT, Jacobs, uh, Saquon, Dobbins, and there's a big argument uh, each way, um, whether these running backs deserve the money that they want or whether they don't. Um, just for some reference, Jacobs was the highest PFF rush grade uh, in 2022, JT uh, in 2021. So these are valuable players, but they're not getting the money that they think they deserve. Um, so I just want to know, like, what are your thoughts on the future of the running back market? And do you think that these players deserve uh, the numbers that they're asking for? Well, deserve is an interesting word, right? Because, you know, a lot of, it, it really depends, right? I mean, I think for most of these players in their best season, so like Josh Jacobs last year, like Josh Jacobs in the moment is worth 
you know, the 12 million that he ended up getting from the Raiders. Certainly. Um, the question is, is in the, like looking at that and trying to project it in the future, it's just, it's just really speculative to say, if a running back produces, let's say, 20 million in, in value on the field, let's say in a season, which is actually not that like it's not that rare. Um the question is, is like, okay, if you if you immediately go and buy back into that asset, is it is it going to re- reliably per- return 20 million year after year after year? And you know, the answer to that question is generally no. Like the answer to the question is because of age curves, because of um how how Imper- the how um dependent production is at running back to the surrounding situation you're just buying an asset that can be valuable in the moment for sure but is not re- valuable over time and so unfortunately for running backs like their market is depressed because they're generally speaking not better gambles than somebody who is you know going to come for far less money and that's just you know that's the nature of the beast same thing's true for kickers same thing's true for punters uh largely true for linebacker safeties and those kind of positions it's just the the name of the game and running backs i think because the fall was so stark if you look at emmett smith's contract when he hold held out for dallas in 1993 um coming off the super bowl they lost their first two games they signed him back they win the super bowl he wins mvp that that deal in like today's dollars would be like 35 million. Um, so I think this happens across the league, but because it's running back and because like a lot of us grew up like idolizing running backs and running backs were like the, the best player on all of our football teams when we were kids and stuff. I think that the the fall off is more drastic than necessarily kind of the 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 state of the system as is. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. And you kind of made a really good point there. It's not necessarily the one year value of those running back contracts. It's the year over year contract value. You know, you see guys like Todd Gurley where he was, you know, almost rushed for 2000 yards, crazy amount of touchdowns that year, two years later, he kind of fell off. And, you know, it's the biggest thing now in this off season where we're seeing a lot is not, not only getting these contracts, but very limited to the franchise tag. You know, they understand that their careers are kind of shortened. So, you know, teams like the Giants, you know, obviously Saquon's kind of a staple of that organization. But, you know, when you're they, they gave him a franchise tag and why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you have a running back for three or four years and then sign him to a franchise tag for that one year rental? And then that's kind of like where they are at that at that moment. And it's like, you know, you you kind of you don't have it's easier to move on from that contract when you're doing that kind of, you know, that contract uh, franchise tag. Yeah, and, and I think that um I think that the big issue in, in that assumption though is and it's being pushed now by players. Like I agree, like the, there's in a perfect world, you know, a Bajan Robinson pick is not as bad because you can kind of flip him later on or you can move on from him. But we know how we know how these teams act, right? We know that in many ways the contract extension for your first round pick is a pat on the back, not only to him, but also to you as the, as the decision maker, right? It's a, it's a trophy in your trophy case. And so for the most part, you know, I I think the same thing about Roquan Smith. I know there are a few people I know in the league who are saying, well, you know, this trade for Roquan, because he's at the tail end of his deal, it's not that expensive. And he's probably going to produce at that level. We're going to, if we let him go, we'll get a comp pick back and it'll offset the draft picks we traded for him. Um, and like, they didn't work that way because what happens when, when Roquan Smith plays really well, well, Eric DeCosta says, well, that was a great move by me. Let me demonstrate to the world that it was a great move by me by signing this guy to a deal. And then ultimately that, that becomes hard. So it's, it, 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 and I think the same thing, I think the same thing about like void years and stuff too, like all these instruments I think can be used properly and, and optimally. And yet at the same time, human nature just always gets in the way, you know? And and so I think that even drafting running backs high is, is a tough sell for me because in practice, we generally speaking, don't end up actually doing what what we need to do to be plus EV. So can you go further into, so Bijan was a high pick. Gibbs was a high pick. Um, We saw Saquon, you know, in recent years uh, that worked out for at least a couple of years, Uh, a couple of years. It didn't, not so much, but, uh, 
What what are your thoughts on Gibbs and Bijan? Are you are you fans of them? Um, what do you, what's your outlook on them? Yeah, I think I think that I mean Bijan Robinson has the potential to be the one of the best running back prospects we've seen in a long time. Um, like sorry, he is be the one of the best running backs in the NFL that we've seen in a long time. He's got really you know he, he's got breakaway speed. He's got tackle breaking ability. I think he was the only uh, running back in college football last year with more than a hundred broken tackles. I'm a fan. I think, um, you know, Gibbs is similar. I think Gibbs, you know, reminds me a lot of Alvin Kamara as far as how he moves and stuff like that. It's just when you, when you, you take a step back and you're Atlanta and, you know, let's say you have injury, like are, who's going to rush the passer for the Falcons? Well, that, you know, that would have been nice to address with pick number eight. Um, who is going to cover people for the Lions? Who is going to play wide receiver for the Lions? Like all those things, I think you could have, addressed with pick 12 and and you know i know who could run the ball for the falcons if they didn't have Deshaun robinson we've already seen tyler algier get a thousand yards in this offense so i think that um i think to me it's just the opportunity cost i like those players and now that they're on the on the team i'm gonna buy into some of them in fantasy i'm going to you know uh, monitor how they're doing you know as, as far as the markets are concerned but they weren't the best option for these teams at, at, you know, in any, in any way, shape or form. Yeah. Couldn't agree more with that. Um, and like kind of the biggest thing I'm pretty in on the Falcons, at least from an offensive standpoint, you know, that's obviously very dependent on how uh, Desmond Ritter um, performs as a quarterback, but you know, they have the highest rated uh, offensive line um, this year or like in years, uh, it's not this year or last year, um, you know, on the ground, and they obviously had Tyler Algier rush for a thousand yards, and you know, with the prospect like Bijan, it's really interesting how he'll look. Um, and also even just like Jameer Gibbs, for example, you know, they took Brian Branch for in the second round, in the middle of the second round. You know, people could have argued that he could have been a top a first round pick. You know, they took Jack Campbell um, later on, like eighteen, I think it was um, later on in the first round, the middle of the first round. And people can argue that there's a uh, positional disadvantage there as well as at linebacker. Um, but then even they came back and got Sam Laporte in the second round, who, you know, is getting a lot of buzz at a camp, you know. So him and both him and Gibbs, both obviously from a fantasy perspective and, you know, just from a t- a team value, player value overall, you know, it'll be interesting to see how this strategy kind of works out for them, given the amount of draft capital that both these teams use on a position uh, like running back. Yeah, for sure. And and it, it'll, yeah, like I said, I don't think, you know, everybody, everybody says, you know, it's like when a team takes a running back in the top 10, they generally do better. It's like, yeah, because if a team needed a quarterback in the top 10, they'd take one unless they were comfortable with the quarterback that they had and a running back can come in. And a lot of times it's, you're in the top, if you, if you're in the top 10 without needing a quarterback, you probably had bad luck at your quarterback the year before. And so hence, you could have, you know, the increased luck in year two. Like there's so many things that in the year that they draft the running back high, there's there's so many things that can increase their water level, but it comes at the expense of future years. And that's that to me is always, you know, when you think about the draft, there's a reason the betting markets don't really move during the NFL draft. A, a lot of that stuff is baked into the cake, but B, draft performance relative to, or, you know, player performance relative to draft slot is pretty noisy. Um, so, you know, you there will be rookies this coming fall who make significant impacts on the teams that they're playing for, but we just don't know which ones there are by nature of, of the way that it goes. Okay, so uh, moving on here, um, now we're going to move into preseason, your preseason takeaways. Um, obviously, we can't take too much away from the preseason – um, but just in general, um, do you have any players that, uh, that have maybe surprised you or, or caught your eye, um, particularly rookies who have, who have performed well, or are going to have a bigger role this year than you initially, uh, thought maybe when training camp started or, or when they were drafted? Yeah, it, it's, it's mostly, you're not going to find out a ton about the starters, mm-hmm. um, you know, obviously Trey Lance not playing well enough to hold on to a backup spot in San Francisco was was troubling. Dorian Thompson Robinson ultimately beat out Kellen Mond and Josh Dobbs, which was interesting. Um, Tyler or Tyson Bajet beat out uh, Philip Walker, who the Bears gave two million guarantees to. 
Uh, the back of quarterbacks are always the most compelling for me. Um, and I think that those were some surprises. Uh, Colt McCoy losing his losing not only his starting job, but also his job in general yeah. um, because, to Clayton Toon and, and Josh Dobbs again uh, was was interesting. Um, beyond that, I mean, I thought that the Washington commanders looked good, but uh, when they when their starters played, uh, which is which is encouraging. Uh, we'll see what happens when the lights come on week two because they play the Cardinals week one. Um, so I, you know, those are some surprises for me, but for the most part, this is a very noisy time of year. I always tell people in fantasy and gambling, it's like, don't actually, don't look at efficiency in the preseason, look at volume where guys play is incredibly important. If a guy's a first round pick and he's playing well into the third quarter of some of these games, you know, that that player is not ready to play. If there's, you know, if they're playing the one series with Aaron Rodgers and then sitting out the rest of the preseason, that's a pretty good indication that they're going to play. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. Um, and you, we kind of see, as you mentioned, you know, these rookies get drafted pretty high. And then, you know, if they're spending a lot of time in the game, you know, that's kind of a bad sign as to kind of their outlook or their, you know, batting projections. Um, but two names I kind of want to go into, I guess three now, um, you know, Jalen Carter, he had a 90, uh, 91 defensive grade, which is third amongst uh, interior defensive linemen. And Will Anderson had an over 90 grade as a pass rusher. Um, and also we've seen uh, Herbig from the Steelers, you know, kind of shown flashes as a rookie. Um, I'm curious, like how, what, what, what is your kind of takeaway from some of these rookies to start, especially, you know, like getting pretty, pretty involved early, you know, getting those high rushing grades, you know, what's, what's kind of your takeaways been so far, at least from that perspective? Yeah. I, you know, it's good um, to be able to beat up. So there, there's, there's a thing in the NFL, right? Like offensive line play is so um, fragile, right. And, and week to week, you know, every single team is probably one offensive line injury away from being, being not so great on the offensive line. And so there is incredible value in defensive linemen being able to beat bad defensive line or bad offensive line. A, because your team, it's a strong link system. So you can always put a guy over somebody else and sort of um, miss a match so that there's a good matchup, but also be like, there are just bad offensive lines in the NFL. And um, I think about that Buffalo um, Cincinnati game. Some of this was weather, uh, induced, but the Bills not being able to beat up on Cincinnati's bad offensive line is probably why they didn't win the Super Bowl last year. And um, so, in the preseason, I look at some of these guys, you know, the Jalen Carters of the world, and the you know Nolan Smith when he was playing, and Josh Huff is a guy for the Jets who constantly uh, pressures the quarterback and things like that. I'm I I I do like to see can this guy absolutely beat up on bad tackles because. Or, or guards because there are bad tackles and guards that play all the time. And so that's the thing that, that really I I'm a, I'm a big believer in on the other side, if a wide, if a corner can shut down a bad wide receiver, I don't necessarily think that that's as valuable because an offense can always sort of put their best wide receiver in an advantageous spot. And then you don't really get to like, say, well, I want this guy on the field, but he's only good against bad players. Like that, that's a tough thing. So in strong link systems like defensive line and, you know, quarterback, for example, I want to see them be able to beat up on bad opponents. Other positions, it's not as important to me. Yeah, you made some really good points there. And, uh, you know, it's 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 pretty crazy to think, you know, a guy like Jalen Carter, obviously getting drafted to the Eagles ninth overall, especially, you know, how good their pass rush was last year. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty crazy to think that they can, they got another guy that's only a rookie. Um, and even Will Anderson too, with the, the amount of draft capital they spent to get to trade up to get him. But you know, it's definitely interesting to to you know kind of analyze those players at least from an early on perspective. Um, but now, kind of want to go more into kind of your outlook on the season. Um, obviously, you have you know I'm sure you've done some stuff in the past with betting with fantasy. You know what what's kind of your biggest um, I guess uh, some of your bigger predictions that you've had. What teams are going to make the biggest jumps? you know, which teams maybe to live up, up to expectation. You know, it seems like everyone's now talking about the Jets constantly because of hard knocks and being in New York. Um, but, you know, I kind of want to get your gauge on, you know, uh, who, who, you know, your biggest predictions on the season. 
Yeah, I think my biggest prediction is that the Green Bay Packers will be better than um, than the markets say. I mean, it I depends upon where you look, but right now they're the least likely team to win the NFC North per some betting markets, and I just I don't buy that. I I, I think um, Green Bay's got a great coach. I think that they have some good pieces: Aaron Jones, Christian Watson, Romeo Dobbs, um, Luke Musgrave. A good offensive line where um, you know they may not have as much depth as they had in the past, but they have. I think a you know five good players there. I think Jordan Love will be better, um, better than my pre-draft eval on him because I, I seem to always miss on those guys that end up being able to develop um, with with that you know sort of strong um, strong arm and athleticism. And I think the defense will be better. I think that you know Joe Barry is on alert. I think that last year the defense let them down, um, but they have some real good talent. I think that they end up being able to leverage that talent this season. Yeah, no, I, I, I really think Jordan Love is going to surprise some people. Um, you know, obviously it's been, it's been, it's difficult to really show yourself, especially when you're kind of been a backup quarterback the first couple of years of living in Rock Roger's shadow, but Roger kind of did the same thing. So I've been, I've definitely been a lot more bullish about the, uh, the Packers um, going into the season, uh, you know, at least compared to the start, just kind of seeing what their office. And I, I really like, uh, Luke Musgrave, that's someone I've been targeting a lot, and they use a decent amount of draft capital to get him. He's been getting a ton of snaps. So be interesting to see how kind of that young receiving core uh, moves on to the season. Um, but, yeah, kind of wanted to shift a little bit uh, now. Um, and the biggest, like, one of the bigger topics, I guess, you, you you have some, I've heard you talk, you know, in previous podcasts about kind of the salary cap and how teams are manipulating that uh, cap space you know, we've seen for years the New Orleans, New Orleans Saints, a uh, perfect example, they kind of push back their salary cap year after year, and it seems like they kind of just reload instead of, you know, you kind of expect them to have a step back within a year. So I'm, I'm curious to hear, you know, how teams are kind of manipulating that cap space and why they're doing it, and do you, do you think it's an effective strategy? It, well, it requires discipline. I. It's so funny because when we were talking just a you know a few minutes ago about you know drafting players and then letting them walk, like that's a good and plus EV plan. I think that in practice it never happens, and I think the same thing's true about you know about the salary cap. I think you know Eagles and Browns right now look like they have a plan. Look like they know. You know, they're going to spend more than every team in the NFL. And then they're going to sort of look at all the con. You know, they're going to take all their veterans. They're going to make the contracts basically fully guaranteed for the most part and prorate the money over as long as they can. So Jalen Hurts, for example, his deals are probably going to be prorated out for the next 10, 15 years. Um, the Eagles will be paying for his services. And if you plan it out and you understand where your risks and your, and your, your um, point in overturn is on players, it could probably work. Now, in practice, most NFL teams um, don't afford their general managers that luxury. Kansas City, for example, has never created a void year in a contract because they've never they're they're one of the lower spenders um, in the league, so they don't have that instrument. And you know, my my boss, you know, when he was with Atlanta, they always said they wanted to spend right up to the salary cap every single year. So there was no ability to roll money over. Like let's say the Cleveland last year when there was really no reason for them to want to compete. They rolled over a bunch of money and they increased their available cap space this year. You really have to have that mentality. And so like I look at the saints, the saints, you know, being cap compliant. Yeah. They're cap compliant, but being cap compliant isn't an edge. It's not an advantage. Everybody has to be cap compliant. Or have you planned Have you used the, those void years have you used proration to make you better i think you can argue no and and i think it's more of like a it's a way to get you out of jail but the problem with the saints is like every single year if they were to get out of every single one of their contracts they would be over the cap because of escalations and stuff and so i think i'll you know i'm i'm willing to reserve judgment on cleveland and philadelphia and minnesota uh when they prorate money um New Orleans to me has not necessarily gained that trust because I always feel like it's one of those kicking the can down the road operations, which is what the average fan thinks of when they think about prorating money. Um, even though there are some teams that are trying to prorate money in intelligent ways. Yeah. I think that's really interesting how it, 
it seems that teams are all doing the same exact thing, but they're not. Um, that's that's really cool. Um, just moving on here. Uh, if you wanted to talk more about your your Marvel um, project at at Sumer, uh, we didn't get to read about it that much, but uh, it seems pretty cool. Um, do you want to go ahead and and tell us more? Yeah. So we have um, you know, our B two B side. We're building tools for NFL teams, and one of them is Marvel. It, it's you know short for maximizing roster value. Ultimately, we're using uh, a tool called optimization to look at your roster and that of uh, of everybody. Um, around you and and basically trying to make decision by decision uh some greedy some meaning that like this decision is just made in a vacuum and some more holistically so like let's say i, I draft this player in the first round um let's simulate the draft after what 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 is going to be the landscape of players that i'm going to have available to me in round uh in round five uh, that kind of thing so it, it's really a roster management tool and it's and it's a way for us to help teams kind of permute through the billions and, 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 you know, multi, you know, multi-billion decisions that, that people can have. Yeah, no, that's, that's some good points. I'm curious, what's your kind of outlook? Like, what are you seeing the biggest trends? Obviously we've, we've seen running backs become kind of a, not as valued. We talked about that previously, but how have you, how have you seen kind of the shift in trends and, how the teams are kind of allotting their cap space and just, you know, your outlook on that. Uh, I think it's going to be, um, I, I think, yeah, it, it's, I think that you're going to see more teams try to leverage the development curves that uh, persist in the NFL. And I know that teams are aware of these things. Whenever I talk to Thomas or somebody else, like I know that they know that these things are different, but they don't necessarily act like them. So, you know, this time of year, like it's pretty easy to get a starting safety this time of year. It's pretty easy to get a starting nickel back this time of year running back. You know, you could pick, you know, Leonard Fournette is literally available to sign with anybody. Um, if you want to, if you need a left tackle this time of year, good luck. Right. And so um, it doesn't make a ton of sense to draft a, a safety high and develop him. Does it make a ton of sense to draft a linebacker and develop him? When for non premium positions, those players are easily accessible throughout the, the, the free agency market. Um, those, are, those are all questions that I think um, I don't know if teams are pinning down specifically yet and that and that to me is a, it can cause an edge like if you never used anything more than like a you know fifth round pick or worse on running backs linebackers centers guards um safeties even tight ends to an extent um and you and you whiffed on all of them how much worse off would you be versus if you used all your high picks on those positions and used all your later picks on edge, left tackle, wide receiver, um, quarterback, cornerback, and interior defensive line, and you whiffed out, like, how much worse you'd be? Well, it's, I think it's pretty clear. I think if, in the latter case, you would have to be trading a first-round pick and $25 million a year for a left tackle or an edge, like the Chiefs did with Frank Clark, and, and so on. And I just think that that kills your franchise versus – you know, bellying up to the bar this time of year and signing Desmond King, who's what you know readily available to be your nickel if you want to. Yeah, no, and and the biggest thing I kind of uh, recognize was you know we've seen, for example, the Bears trade up, trade down not, uh, eight spots to get you know for the for the Panthers to move to get Bryce Young, and while Bryce Young isn't you know maybe on the same level of a you know quarterback prospect like Caleb Williams next year, but the kind of the bigger thing that people don't recognize is that that quarterback contract value that premium position value uh, shapes up your roster for so many years you know as you mentioned you have um uh, Orlando Brown uh he kind of was he kind of got a big contract this this offseason but that kind of took away a lot of what the Chiefs can do because now they can't necessarily pay Chris Jones now um so I'm I'm curious actually that was that was different because they signed it was Jawan Jaw uh, Taylor I believe for the uh for the Chiefs. So they, they kind of had to pay pay up a lot for that tackle position and now they can't sign one of their studs in uh Chris Jones. Um so I kind of think that's like the bigger thing that people don't realize is that 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 
uh, quarterback or that just overall uh, positional value that you get from kind of having that that uh, player with a smaller contract that kind of goes into a big effect for years to come for that team. Yeah, and and it, the spoils for development are just so much more sweet then, right? Because you know you take Andrew Thomas, Giants draft him fourth overall. He's horrendous in year one, and now he's one of the highest paid tackles in football. You were like think about how much better that is because, you know, tackle, if you wanted to access one in free eight, well, for one, you've already gotten three and now, you know, 3.5 um, years of like team control for cheap. You've already gotten a ton of surplus value there, but also relative to the market, you don't have to develop him anymore. You don't have to bring somebody in with all the question marks about what happens when he changes team and scheme, all that kind of stuff. And you just have like a cornerstone player in your franchise now. And, and yeah, the development, whereas if a safety were to, you know, you were developed, you spend all this capital, he sucks for two years. It comes at the expense of your team doing well. And then he develops into a great safety. Well, that's fine, but you can get Jesse Bates in free agency. You can get, um, you know, for the most part, starting caliber safety play as well in free agency. And so the spoils of developing a great player there, they're good, but they're not, it's not out of this world the same way it is at left tackle, edge, you know, all those other positions. Yeah, I'm a I'm a Giants fan. So uh I could say that it's probably maybe the only uh good thing that Gettleman left us with was uh was Andrew Thomas there. Um yeah. just to just to wrap up here, um, what advice would you give to to people who are looking to get into this space, uh, whether it be sports analytics in general or or football analytics specifically? Um I it's it's tough because I would say be willing to tackle problems that no one else has sort of thought about. So, you know, when I was at PFF, it was like special teams. It was tracking data. Everybody at PFF was scared of the tracking data because they thought it would put us out of um, put us out of business. And it's like, well, you OK, you can you can worry about that or you can work on that and see if you know where it could add value. You can get out ahead of it. Um you know, and think about sports that are not as well developed. Football, you know, it was amazing because if, you know, if I would have tried my hand in baseball, I would have tried my hand in basketball, maybe, you know, when I started in 2015. Like, I don't, I, I think it's pretty clear that I, I wouldn't be anywhere close to the leader in that field. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, that, and, and that's because you chose something that no one else was working on. So, you know, MLS teams, there's a 30, 40 of them now, and they all need analysts. Um, you know, lacrosse, cricket, all those sports that, you know, don't have these big teams, um, you could make some groundbreaking uh, changes to that game. Um, so just being being available for that. And, and some people thrive and just know where you thrive. Some people thrive in like very generalist roles. Like I know, you know, one, you know, one of the reasons, you know, I, I, I made a change is because I still wanted to be a generalist as opposed to a specialist. Um, some people are very good at being specialists and you just have to know that if you're a specialist, you might thrive in a baseball environment, um, a, a, a basketball environment. If you're a generalist, you might, you know, you might thrive in an MLS team or a, an NFL team or a college football. Um, but it just depends. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's some, some really good advice. And it's very difficult, especially for college students like us, um, you know, when you have kind of a career path with all your, your classes and stuff, you kind of miss, miss out on kind of the, the bigger aspects of this kind of project. Cause you know, even for example, uh, Paige, Seth, he, uh, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll post so many Twitter. It's like what people actually think football analytics is where it's where you're <laughs> doing all the stats, where, whereas you're more just cleaning up that data. Um, so I'm curious also, do you have any advice for people getting in more into that data science space? Um, you know, kind of polishing up on those uh, computer science skills and just coding skills overall. Yeah, one of my um, data scientists at Sumer, Parker Fleming, that you know, he does a really good job of writing down your assumptions on a pay on a piece of paper because that will lead you to, and then start with simple models. Like you can get so far um, in trying to understand how much something is worth working on by just simply even in tracking data by taking a linear model and looking at what variables um you know are significant and that that's not the be all end all that's not the you're, you would never put something like that in production but literally just seeing oh, are these two things related 
Um, if I add an interaction term, what happens? Like, you know, think simple initially. I think thinking simple initially is really helpful because it will it will help you avoid getting too far away from the actual problem. Couldn't agree more. Yeah, it's it's definitely hard um, picking up those skills at first, but it, you do make some good points. Kind of start starting out with smaller projects um, and working through those, and kind of deal uh, getting through those problems yourself instead of you know just having someone else working on it for you. Um, but that, that's some great advice there. Um, but with that, uh, we're kind of going to wrap up here. But Eric, thank you so much for hopping on the pod with us. You know, you were, we obviously wanted you really back uh, back after your last guest speaker event a couple of years ago. And it's it's really special that you could kind of hop on at this point, especially with the, the season coming so close. We're excited to, to, you know, witness some NFL football, some college football. So, you know, it's, it was really special to have you on. Of course, and and you know, I appreciate the work that you guys are doing um, in giving not only obviously yourselves, but also all the people in your society a, an opportunity. Um, this work is, you know, it, it's really really important, and I think you know uh, what you guys are doing is helping give people access to sports that wouldn't otherwise have access to them. So don't don't take what you're doing at you know uh, at your school lightly, and and uh, and your your place in the broader community because. Uh, it, it's so cool that you guys and then the people, you know, you guys have more opportunities than I ever had and the people that come be, but, you know, after you guys will have more opportunities than you had. And I think that that is an incredible testament to the hard work that you guys are doing and to the community as a whole.